Oh my goodness, would you would you look at uh, look at the clock work tower of the church? Then look below. There you get the red roof of the church. Look further below, and there you see two houses. And on the left one, there's actually written butcher since 1804. I can read that from this distance. If you look, uh, if you look at the butcher, and then goes in a straight line to the east we're going to find first two houses with a red roof and then we're going to find a barber shop oh my goodness i can actually read this <laughs> okay yeah like high um high textures high quality textures awesome developers people nowadays have more vram so please optimize the heck out of your game so why Oh my goodness, we already have four warehouses and you guys are still going. Uh, overwork. Okay, I'm going to send that one. Now we're going to improve these ways. You. Okay, are we done now? Are they actually checking? Oh my goodness. It's a bit problematic, especially later in Anno 1800, when you do these escort quests, you might notice, even though we're fighting them, they're still shooting at the one we're supposed to protect. So if your escort is not big enough, even if you destroy all of them, they're going to still snipe the schooner and you're going to fail the quest. So you're going to have to have a lot of firepower later on, so that doesn't happen. Oh, they're still not done. Yeah, maybe we should just go for regular speed and this is going to go a bit faster. We careen into the unknown. The Iron Dragon, cornered by a fearsome Pyphorian vessel. Your expedition has reached South America at last, and the crew are looking forward to some well-earned rest. Night has fallen, and your ship is already in the tranquil bay when the lookout screams, Behind us! There, looming in the darkness, gleams a dragon of iron. I was about to say Sauron. I watched the last episode, and... Um, I saw it coming. I was right with the identity of Sauron. I'm not going to say the name. If you haven't watched the early episodes, you don't know what I'm talking about. And um, I do like the small pieces and bits of information they put throughout the series. And if you listen to the dialogue of the character that turned out to be Sauron again, you're going to get a lot of hints, even though I didn't really like 
how they created this Galadriel finds out in one episode, suddenly, oh my goodness, this information, oh, so he's not the one he's supposed to be. And that, of course, um, felt a bit rushed. There should have been more hints, especially for Galadriel to notice. I would have made the storyline better, even though I, I definitely liked that conversation. Oh my goodness, the conversation was great that they had. I mean, this illusion thing of Valinor and the little raft on the ocean and there there was just well done even though there is one sort of criticism to do um the actress of galadriel i'm not sure if he, she's trying to make an ian mckellen ian mckellen is usually acting with his eyes but he still has a lot of facial muscles and they're moving very well but she kind of doesn't move her face her muscles she, her emotions are just usually blank sometimes it works looking stern looking earnest maybe looking in the distance or something trying to look cool but uh, she always does it which means that she has a, a bit of problems acting in that regard i mean her, her voice her lines are decent but uh, she could work on on what her face does that's a bit underwhelming if you for example compare it with Ian mckell i mean okay it's a bit uh, we talked about this earlier um, Ian McKell and Patrick Stewart and all of these people, all of these great actors, they come from theatre. And there is a massive difference between a movie actor from Hollywood and a theatre actor. You see, in Hollywood, you don't need special good skills in acting. Because you can rehearse, you can reshoot a scene 200 times until you get it right. But as a, an actor in a theatre, you get one try. The premiere when the audience is before you you have to deliver and you have to deliver it properly you're only going to get one shot which means that a theater actor needs another skill set a theater actor needs to be able to command his face to command him to be in character momentarily and do it properly because he only has one shot at it and an actor in hollywood they don't need that if they need 6,000 takes to get the scene right, they're going to get 6,000 takes. That's a bit, that's a difference. And people like Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart and all of the other ones, great actors. I mean, <clears throat> I know that a couple of people come, what, Patrick Stewart in Star Trek Picard? He was terrible. That's your opinion. <clears throat> but we can agree on Ian McKellen. And... You definitely notice when an actor that acts in Hollywood comes from theater or still works for theater at theaters because their acting skills are beyond, I mean, they are off the charts. If you compare it to ordinary actors who are not playing in theater, you're going to notice a massive difference in quality. Even though with all the rehearsals and all the reshootings, you're still going to notice this level of quality. Okay. Is nostrils livid with a fire? It's the vassal that killed Mr. Good! But this one must be twice as large. Oh my, oh large. We are at their mercy. However, the bay is hidden from the bright gaze of the moon, and it is possible the dragon has not yet spotted you, only to somehow hinder it long enough to flee. So we 100% that, yeah, fight your way out. Your aim is true. But the dragon is gathering its hot breath. To engage the hulking vessel is a humbling experience. The size, the power, the feet, thick, armored hull that your ordnance seems to only bounce limply off. The crew seems defeated until they realize their precise fire at the dragon's stern, while showing no external sign of damage, appears to have caused a problem in the engine room. As a response, masked figures rush to prime the beastly mouth. A great cannon of fire. You must act quickly. Maintain your fire on the weakened engine. 100%. Yeah, we're going to destroy it. Maintain your fire on the weakened engine. Your crew cheers the cannoneers, and one good hit to the same spot does the trick. There are loud rasping noises before the ironclad engines fall silent, and the great monstrosity drifts to a gentle halt. As your crew escape, they are forced to pass close by the enemy, and see the gnarled and hateful iron of the bows and boards, the army of mocking masks, 
and the fire pit of a mouth that could easily have been their end. The expedition may be free to find Samento now, but it is worrying that the Pathorians always seem to be one step ahead, and are possessed of such fearful machinery. You set up camp in a secluded inlet further up the coast, confident it will keep you well hidden. So, let's talk about Rings of Power. <laughs> um, Adar is great, I love him. The Orc design is great. The relationship between Durin and Elrond are oh, magnificent. Um, I like Halbrand. I am not liking the fighting choreography, that's terrible. Uh, the dialogues often are a bit cringe and not good, not well done, except the parts where I told you about, for example, other. Oh my goodness. And they're actually letting. I never thought it. Emma's and the Chief, the unimaginable. They're, they're making me root for Sauron. I mean, what? How did they. <laughs> That's a magnificent feat. If, if five years ago someone would have told me when I heard about the Rings of Power project, uh, you're going to like Sauron, you're going to simp for him, you're going to root for him. You don't care. Well, you won't care about Galadriel and the elves. Who cares? I would have told him. <laughs> well, of course, of course. I, I'm still not a fan of the design language of the elves. Sometimes the clothes. I mean, in the last episode, Galadriel's um, first Callum Burnbrough's clothes were good. Galadriel's dress was beautiful. I liked it. Elvish, uh, but usually. Um, it's just terrible, especially the armor. The ceremonial armor of the first episode was beyond terrible. And um, I don't like the, the design of the elves with the short hair. And every male elf has short hair. Kelimbrimbor has short hair. Elrond has short hair. Arondil has short hair. Gilgalad has short hair. I don't understand why. And the ears look terrible. Especially with Gilgalad. His ears looked so flashy and not elegant. They looked like someone, like a, a butcher would have tried to become, um, well, someone working on human flesh. You know, there's professionals and they're butchers. It's the same with boob jobs. Some are done by artists and some by butchers. And the elf ears in Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, um, yeah, they've definitely done been done by butchers. They look terrible. And the short hair, I mean, when the first two episodes aired and I saw Arondir with um, the short hair, I thought, hmm, that's odd, but he is in kind of a war zone, ex-war zone, he's a sentry guard and... Maybe it's just unpractical. I kind of get why a soldier and an, an active soldiering job in a foreign country would not have long hair. You, you could pull him, you, and etc. etc. Even though that was never a problem in the lore of, of, of Lord of the Rings. So I, I kind of made up reasons for that. But then Elrond came and he had short hair, and Kilombrimbor came and he had short hair, and Gilgalad came and he, all of the elves had sh uh, short hair. And that just looks hideous. And. It especially is a problem because obviously um, the ears they had, the elvish ears, were prosthetics. So these weren't done by CGI. And Peter Jackson and his team, they always made sure that the part where the prosthetic gets attached to them, the natural ear of the human actor, gets covered by hair. So because of the long hair, they were able to make the ears look more elegant, more decent. And Amazon didn't understand that. And be also because of that, that just looked terrible. Give elven males, please, good long hair. Again, I, I kind of see reasons why it could be argued in certain situations where elves would have short hair, but seriously, all the male dominant characters in the entire season had short hair. Elves? I don't. I mean, it was also a bit odd when I when I saw the trailer about the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. First, I didn't really like Durin's wife. Um, not because of the skin color. They were racists online who, oh, she has darker skin tone. Terrible. Fuck those people. Um, that's not the problem. The problem was her lack of beard, and I still have a problem with that. Obviously, from the law perspective. Um, dwarven females should have beards and also so 
Um, there are written statements about that. And, of course, the movie trilogy by Peter Jackson. A small scene where Gimli says, um, sometimes people mistake dwarven females for males because of the beards. That's a bit odd. And, again, with the short hair with Arondir. So, those two, I didn't really like in the trailer, but oddly enough, it turned out that both of them are great in the roles they play. Arondir is probably the one of the well played the best played elves in the entire season. He, he actually plays an elf with his face and sometimes being a little bit diplomatic, a little bit arrogant, but not too much. Sometimes a little bit mm, laid back, but also always mm, how should I call that? Um, in the moment, always observant, never naive or something. And obviously, Durian's wife. My goodness. She did a splendid. The actress, she did a splendid job. I really like those scenes. Um, that's a. You see, Hollywood often wants to make women tough. And um, usually that doesn't work out. It's just sometimes ridiculous. But in that case, it worked out very well. She's definitely just a tough, dwarven female woman woman and my goodness i like her and i th that's odd because in the trailer both of these characters are on here and dude's wife i didn't really like and then those two turned out great and when i saw in the trailer Callum Burnbord and gil Gallard, i thought oh my goodness you are awesome gil Gallard and and look at the version we got in, in the series and that wasn't um convincing but still overall they did a good job the first two episodes were good the last episode was good to very good in between there were um, a lot of problems mm. but overall it's a, it's a decent fantasy experience it's certainly not lord of the rings level um do not go in there and and watch it with the expectation level of i need a masterpiece then you're going to get heavily disappointed think about i want to watch a fantasy series with um a lord of the rings topic and I want to enjoy it, and you can do that. But do not go in there and... I need absolute law of friendliness. Everything that happens must be confirmed in the books. I mean, it's, that's ridiculous anyway, because if you look at Peter Jackson's trilogy, you're going to find out he did a heck load of differences. There's so many things he um, differentiated. I mean, he, he, did, he deleted Glorfindel and replaced him with Arwen. He made up elves fighting in Helm's Deep. There, there's so many things that Peter Jackson changed, and it still turned out good. Don't get me wrong. Uh, we have to remind ourselves of the fact um, nowadays Peter Jackson's *Lord of the Rings* trilogy is considered a masterpiece by most people on on the World Wide Web, most popular people on the on the planet. But back when it came out, there were so many haters. How dare he made up elves fighting in Helm's Deep? Oh, there is no Tom Bombadil. What? This is not good. Blah, 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 blah. There were a heck lot of people who criticized Peter Jackson for making changes to the source material. Christopher Tolkien spearheading that. He hated Lord of the Rings. He said it's an abomination, of capitalism and earning money, blah, blah, blah. He didn't like it at all. Even though personally, I believe that he's on that specific occasion spat on the image of his father because J.R.R. Tolkien would definitely have liked to see the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I think that he would have tried to um, gatekeep his story. You need to do it exactly how I wrote it. No, he would have enjoyed people enjoying the story his creation he would have seen the love and dedication and beauty that peter jackson and friend walsh and all the others on the team managed to create and he would have enjoyed that and it's a bit of it's sad that his son couldn't see it i mean his son dedicated his life to preserving the creations of his father and i believe he cornered himself into Everything needs to be in line with what my father wanted. And anyone who tries to do anything not exactly how my father wanted it is an enemy of Lord of the Rings. And I believe that that was a terrible mistake by Christopher Tolkien. And he's dead now, so there's no changing that. Okay. 
You set up camp in a secluded inlet further up the coast, confident it will keep you well hidden. Uh huh. Oh, well, that's it. Continue provide accelerations, of course. Okay, so here we do not have clay. Well, that's not a problem right now. Um, I just want to get a couple guns. Just for later, so we have it. So once I need resources, we can just get them from here. Yeah, let's just get two guns. A few guns in placement here. How far could they shoot here? Should we build them? The problem is if we build them too far out, they could get sniped by the enemy. <clears throat> Potential enemies. And here they're going to get supported, obviously, by our, our main... Oh, I could place it here. Our main trading post. Even though I also noticed often in our NO1800, especially in late game, when the enemies come in with 10 and 15 ships, you have a problem because they are always going to snipe your trading post. And you can't destroy them fast enough. And then you, um, when you get besieged in NO1800 by an enemy force, there is a bar sort of the will to fight the courage level and when specific when the trading post gets demolished your courage level will drop significantly and they're going to have a massive problem surviving so that's kind of a deal breaker all right um yeah there's nothing here that interests me There's nothing that we can do here right now. I mean, we could build a couple more people. We're going to need them. Mm, farm residences. Oh, why not? Let's get more people here. is the most underestimated of the virtues. Vincent Rex or water carrier reputation. What heartless rumors to spread about a grieving widow. Mm, you're grieving. Aye, 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 aye. Well, you probably killed your husband, huh? And a most trusted member of Her Majesty's Council. Uh, it would be but a favor to the world to strip them off their hearts completely. I hope you find Seriously? She's not very friendly, but the good thing is we already have a couple of ships here, so they can get to that very soon. Ready for a challenge. La Corona was always an empire of seafood. Is it wrong to want more? Oh, we got fur by trading. So theoretically, we could even upgrade our residences, but we don't really need that. So that would be kind of a waste, so I'm not going to do that. But let's look at our imports. How's that one looking? 260, Tatasha farm, goggles. Ah, exchange ratio 1 to 4. My goodness, that's kind of great. We can easily get resources. Oh, Mandrake. Oh dear. And Besa. Oil. Yeah, we're going to need resources here. Uh, later on. I kind of like this. Oh, we can have four. Oh, three contracts all at once. That's great. Um, Let's sell. Could go for potatoes. I don't mind. And we're going for. Effective export import contracts. Import this good hops. Uh, where do I get hops? Let's unlock all of that for now. Where are hops? Why can't I import that? Oh, 
Ah, we need... Okay, okay, that's hops. Okay. Uh, sausages. Import sausages. You serious? I'm never going to need that, so I don't care. Uh, we're going for fur. Current leading Admiral. item, fish. Admiral. Okay. Then fish it is again. Mm, it's obviously the leading export item. And they just want 12 active... Act oh my goodness. Plantain, import. Plantains or coffee? Where do I find plantains or coffee? There is no plantains or coffee here. Hmm. Export fish, current leading... So it doesn't really matter what we get. It just matters if we get something. Um, I mean, the only thing that I really need... Uh, that's fur coat. So, okay. 16... And... Sale... Yeah, why not? We don't really need them. Let's get more fur. Done. Export volume. Ship constructed. Is that the volume um, over time or what we export right now? Hmm. Fleet ready. Do I have to care about that? Uh, okay, let's send them to. De no, that's a waste. We're going to send those to destroy him later on. And we're going for expedition, right? Finding Somendo. I'll mark her on the map with an S. Says local man Hamon, whom Sir Archibald sent to accompany you. Why not an X? Says the captain with an air of disappointment. Samento, says Hamon, his eyes sparkling with life. Finding her is the key to everything. It's kind of interesting. Um, I recently began to reread Lord of the Rings. I, I already read it twice when I was a child and, well, someone growing up. Now I'm an adult. And now I look at text with more clarity of detail and all of that. And uh, Lord of the Rings by, uh, by J.R. Tolkien is a masterpiece. But he also often says 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 it's when i grew up and learned to speak english i was taught that you should try to um get a vocabulary beyond he said she said the tree said that's just don't do it too often but then again that's that also often happens after one another sentence after another uh, and the Lord of the Rings. Now, I am in no way... Dis <laughs> oh, well, I was about to say authorized, but let's just say um, qualified to criticize um, the linguistic skills of a mighty professor Tolkien who created several languages just out of the heck of creating um, a nice story. So um, he's <clears throat> the high lord of, of languages. Still, I would have liked to see certain phrases in the Lord of the Rings with them. Mm, you could say another style of writing. Obviously, it's designed. He certainly is not lacking in vocabulary. He could have, oh my goodness, plastered the story with detailed descriptions of how humans, uh, well, communicate. But he chose not to. You, that's that's the difference. Um, when people are using this way of dialogue. He says, then she says, and he says, and there is no, I don't know, he grumbled or noted, something along the lines of that, just differentiating the words. And some people are not capable of doing it another way. And Tolkien obviously chose to write this way. So since it's his choice, I'm not going to say anything else about that. 
I am going to say, however, that I definitely enjoyed the foreshadowing in The Lord of the Rings. He often foreshadows what is to come. For example, before the Mines of Moria story with the Balrog, Aragorn already, I believe it was to Frodo, said that uh, Gandalf would give his life and even fall into darkness line, along the lines of that. And obviously it's foreshadowing his fall into darkness in the shadows with the Battle of the Balrog. And Tolkien often does that. When you read between the lines and read very carefully each and every word, Tolkien is going to spoil you of what is to come, and that is a great way of writing. It's not, it's not obvious. When you're not reading very carefully, you're not going to notice. And that is what also makes The Lord of the Rings great. If you read between the lines, you're going to get pieces of the story before anyone else. 